what I want to talk about today is the concept of neurological and sensory remapping following an amputation. Now, I'll flash up on the screen shortly the organization chart of how the sensory and motor cortex are organized. On the, on the sensory and motor cortex, there is the brain. Sensory takes sensory data. Motor means movement, so it's output information. There are certain areas that are adjacent to each other. So, for example, on the, on the sensory cortex, the genitals and the feet are right next door to each other. The hands and the face are also right next to each other. Now, this is important because if we lose, um, if we lose this, this hand is gone. Um, the area of the brain that detects and sensory data from this, this part, this limb, still wants information coming in, still wants to process data, but it's not getting any because there's no, there is no hand to supply the data. So this is the theory that seems to hold up, and this is what Ramakandran posited, is the, sensory, the area of the sensory cortex that takes the information from the hand effectively steals information coming from the face because it's the nearest adjacent neurological structure taking the sensory information in. Because they're right next to each other, the cells dedicated to the hand don't get the data, so they take it from the face. Now when somebody has an amputation, one of the effects we'll tend to see is that if we get a simple, a simple cotton bud, what I will tend to do is I will wet these and put them in the freezer so they come out as a nice lump of ice on the end. If we touch it to the cheek, often the person will feel that the sensation is in the phantom hand. And it tends to be on the cheek, like so, down aspects of the neck and the upper shoulder. Now, the person will, have, will have at times, often when they're shaving or washing, they will feel as they're washing that, hang on, if I feel that in the phantom. But all too often it gets dismissed. It's one of those things that it's difficult to talk about because if they do, maybe people think they're crazy because everyone says there is no phantom, there is no arm there, how can it be hurting? So we'll what we're able to do using the Q-tip is begin to map out where on the face exactly which parts of the limb. So for example, a forefinger may be here, a thumb may be here, and a thumb may also be here. It's not an exact map. It's just a, a leaking of the sensory data. Now, here's what I found. If I've got a, a limb that is contracted and it's tight and it won't release, but I'm able to map where on the face, neck, and shoulder this, this limb is, what I can actually do is put sensory data into the phantom by massaging and manipulating these areas. And one of the things you can do, it takes practice, is quite literally, if that's the phantom, we map it out, and I literally I'll draw this with a biro or a pen, and I can map it out and I can massage the right areas to begin to release areas in the phantom because sensory data coming into here goes to the, the sensory motor cortex of the face and also to the, to the limb that's not there. So we can literally, with a bit of massaging, begin to ease the problems here. Now, one of the things I had difficulty with was finding, if, you, if the foot maps to the genitals, one of the, one of the experiences people will have is they will quite literally feel an orgasm as well as in its usual location they'll also feel it in the phantom foot. You can begin to imagine some of the experiences they will have upon sexual arousal, upon the effect of the phantom. So here's the thing that we've found. In using the mirror box, and sometimes it is absolutely ineffective, there is no benefit whatsoever. More commonly with lower limb than upper limb. Most commonly, the hand remaps to the face. It's not so common that the foot gets remapped to the genitals. So the people that tend to experience um, sexual arousal and, and sexual sensations in the phantom foot is not one of those things they tend to discuss very often. And it may even be the clinicians they discuss it with are unfamiliar with that phenomenon. Here's the rule of thumb that I found. When sensory remapping has occurred, which tends in upper limb to be about three quarters of the time, that's my own estimate, in lower limb, probably about a tenth of the time. When sensory remapping has occurred, 
the mirror box will be 100% successful, provided you can overcome the difficulty, which I've demonstrated in the second video, of getting the contracture inside into the mirror box. Where there is no remapping, so that we can touch the face in various stimulus and there is no crossover sensation, I found the mirror box isn't always that successful. And in which case I'll be in another video be outlining how to work with those situations.